So when we look at spelling and why things are spelled the way they are, I know we're talking about uh, the sessions called Morphology Mondays. Um, probably because as a language arts teacher, I like to make alliterative titles. But really, we're talking about orthography. We're not just talking about morphology. And in the little videos that I've been building, um, it truly is about understanding how the history or the story of the word can sometimes be the key that unlocks the understanding of why a certain thing functions the way it is. So we can't just isolate in on one of these parts. We have to look at all the parts. And it, sometimes it makes more sense to spend a lot of time and energy looking at the morphology. And then there's other times where it makes a lot of sense to dig into the etymology um, because that's gonna help us understand the why. So today's chunk of time together um, comes from a question from last time that we were together in December. And we were talking about um, building different words and within a family and how sometimes the pronunciation of the base um, changes depending on what's added to that base, the, the prefixes and the suffixes. And so the question came out, so why does that happen? Why does pronunciation change within a word family as we're adding those bits those pieces, the morphemes, if you will, um, to the word. So that's what we're focusing on for this chunk of time together. So friends, let me tell you, this rabbit hole was deep and expensive. Um, oh my, I tried to boil it down into some easy to understand parts and I understand fully how if this is an area that you're not super confident in or you know I'm I just I'm doing it because I'm supposed to do it I you know like I don't have time for this I don't have time for this Charlie um I understand because I started looking up content around uh this word and I I had to walk away and I had to come back and I walked away again and I came back because it was big. And so I'm hoping that through sessions like this um, and other resources that we can share that we can simplify the process a little bit because I am not, I do not have a degree in etymology. I do not have a degree in linguistics. I'm a language arts teacher uh, by trade who happens to enjoy learning about this kinds of things. So I used uh, the Real Spelling Toolbox as well as the online um, dictionary, Edam Online, uh, for the bulk of the content today. Um, the Real Spelling uh, website and the Real Spelling Toolbox are not what I would consider pretty places to go for information, uh, but if you're looking to dig in, um, you, it's, a, it's a paid access piece um, for, I want to say the toolbox, not the real spelling, one of the two you pay for. Um, I bought a lifetime membership because I was like, this project is never going away. Uh, but not all of the content in there is free. Um, and some of it is a struggle to kind of get through. So we introduced this idea um, last time about narrowing down or, or sorting out our work or our investigation or our thinking in three areas. Can you use the word um, in a sense to represent its meaning? Like, do you know what the word means? Uh, because you're not gonna know if you're on the right track as you start to dig into the story or the pieces, if you don't know what the word means, that's it just not gonna, it's not gonna be helpful. Then can you take the word and figure out how it's part, how it's built. Is it um, a base with some prefixes and suffixes? Um, is it actually, um, so a free base is a, a base that stands alone as its own word. A bound base is um, a word that has to have stuff attached to it in order for it to become a word. Um, some resources that you come across start referring those to roots uh, and 
so there's some conflation around terminology, I would just say. Um, so just be mindful as you as you dig deeper into this, if you happen to, to decide to do that, there is some differences in how we label um, those bases. So I picked the word sign because that was the word that came up with this question. And we talk about how we always want to ground the words that we're looking at in some sort of a text or context for students. And so part of my rabbit hole digging was looking for um, a, a book or a story or a poem that had the word sign in it. But honestly, friends, I just kept coming back to this. Um, I told my husband about that and he's like, I don't even know that song. And I was like, you, my friend, I had the whole album. Like, what are you talking about? They only had one good song. I had the album. Um, anyways, that video is horrible. Like I watched it. What, what were we thinking is all I know. Um, so thank you, Sherry, for being right there with me. Yeah. Ace of base. I saw the sign. Uh, you're welcome. You're going to be humming that for the rest of the night. So when we look at the word sign, oh yeah, I'm going to play that again because it's super duper helpful. Um, it in itself is a uh, base. There's nothing attached to it. And this is where um, I started digging into sign. Oh, I'm so glad Chantel. I was going to warn you guys, this is what happens when Lana's not here. No one's here to keep me in check. And I'm like, yes, there will be a music video in this recording. Um, just kidding. Lana would be all over it. So I'm looking at sign as a noun um, for this particular context. Now, this is where it gets a little murky because I normally wouldn't have necessarily differentiated between sign as a noun and sign as a verb. But when you look at the lineage or the story behind those, they're slightly different. I'm going to show you that in just a second. So the old French version of sign as a noun would have been pronounced something like signe. Um, if you go further back in time, oh geez, sorry, my mouse went a little crazy there. If we go back to Latin, which P.S. I don't speak, um, it would be something like signum. And why are we even talking about this? Well, I want to point out to learners, to students, perhaps to y'all, um, that the, the GN has always been there. So lots of times when we learn the story of the word, we can find a marker or a connection that's included in the current spelling that's like a little flag waving to the history of the story. P.S. That's why there's an L in walk and talk. Um, but in this particular case, it's always had these letters as part of its spelling. Um, does that help us remember the spelling of it? Meh, probably not so much, but it tells us that, you know, we're, we're working with what existed. It's not like we're adding in um, random letters. And you might be like, did they ever add in random letters? Yes, that happened at one point for some words. So if I go to um, the Edam Online Dictionary, you'll see here that they've sorted the difference between sign, noun, and sign, verb. And so we have a slightly different uh, spelling here between the noun in the um, French and the Latin. And this is where, as I explained to you earlier, the rabbit hole was deep and the rabbit hole was vast. Um, so I tried to simplify it by just saying, you know what, no matter where you go in that rabbit hole, the story is telling us that those letters were always part of, of its spelling. So once we have an idea of um, that story, we can start looking at word families. And so because sign is its own free base, it's a word that exists without stuff attached to it, um, we can start building other words with that in mind by adding prefixes and suffixes. 
Now in the past, in our time together, I've suggested writing the base in the middle and then writing all the words around the outside that you can think of that are connected to that particular base word. And that's still a great activity to do, but another way that you can have students work with this is to introduce them to the concept of a word matrix. Now, this particular word matrix, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, this word matrix that you're seeing right now is incomplete. It does not include every possible structure for the words with the base of SIGN sign. Um, there is a website that's linked on this slide deck that I use to make this um, matrix. Again, it's not pretty, but it's functional. So if you're looking to build some matrices with your students, um, you can visit the mini matrix maker and um, plug it in as, as it tells you to, and it'll build this little red boxed um, matrix for you. You don't need to have a complete matrix, and you can always add to the matrix as your students start to discover or see other words that could be considered part of that word family. Remember, a word family is connected by meaning or um, definition and elements or spelling. The letters are going to match up. Okay. You always read a matrix um, from left to right. You don't have to pick a more frame uh, from each column, but if you start, so here we have RE, I can't skip here. Um, and then this line here in the matrix is telling me I can't go RE and then add it to something up here. I have to stick in my little zone, basically. Um, so I can make the word DE plus SIE is rewritten as DESIE. I G N sorry, um, design, or I can have redesign. You, uh, as you know, um, when we start to bring parts together, there are changes that happen um, with bases and suffixes. Um, this particular base word doesn't have that happening. Um, so when you start to work with word matrices, you intentionally decide Am I picking a base word, maybe one that has that final non-syllabic E um, or marker E at the end that we know can make changes happen when we start adding other um, things to it. And at that point, you're changing how the students are interacting with the matrix perhaps and asking them, when is it that um, we have suffixing the suffix is causing changes in, in how we're spelling or building the words. So you could offer to your students a word matrix and say, what words can you build from this word matrix? And so we have the base word sign here. So I could have, oops, my apologies. So I could have sign, S-I-G-N plus S, that's there, is rewritten as S-I-G-N-S, signs. I could have, hmm, let's see, uh, A-L as what I'm adding to S-I-G-N plus A-L is rewritten as S-I-G-N-A-L, signal. Now, this is where you can decide how deep you want to go in focusing on certain things. So maybe you've spent a lot of time on um, the ED suffix to take something from present tense into past, sorry, into past tense. And so I might pause and say like, okay, so what is that suffix doing to this word? You'll notice here in this matrix, I have got sign, um, noun, and sign verb all living in the same place. You could separate them out if that made more sense to you and your learners. 
um, to take out the actions versus the nouns. Um, or you could have a conversation about how it's all connected um, and related and how is it different? How is it similar? Um, a sign is a verb versus sign is a noun. Then you get into things like RE plus SIGN is rewritten as R-E-S-I-G-N and we have resign as the word. Um, in this case, the the prefix RE is acting like um, like a negative, like a un, like UN, right? Um, not as in re as in do it again, like you are seeing here. So now we're in a situation, perhaps, or an investigation with our students to talk about, so do prefixes or suffixes always have the same meaning or connotation? Did that, does that change? What does that look like? I have no idea. So if you, if that's the follow-up question, you're gonna have to wait until February. Um, so, you know, when we have, and I'm not saying don't do this, um, but when we focus on say a certain prefix or a certain suffix, um, and we just say like, this means this, like the end. Um, then when you come to a situation where we have RE used in a different way, that makes you go, wait a second, that's, that wasn't the rule. Um, and now it becomes an exception. Well, maybe it was never an exception. And maybe we just didn't know all the parts that we needed to know in connection to that, that particular meaning. Um, again, as I'm doing this learning, I'm noticing that um, some suffixes and prefixes are like interconnected and interrelated and so it, over time or in different situations um they all mean the same thing they're just written with different letters uh so again this is not easy work uh and it is messy exactly what um chantelle said is messy messy work um but also kind of fun like it's that makes me think of science experiments that are you know, you, you want to do, but you don't want to do. Um, how is the word sign and the word signature connected? Um, now, this is where, and again, my background knowledge is, is limited in this area, um, but part of my rabbit hole digging was trying to find that connection between sign and signature. And where is that connected? Somewhere back in the Latin land of things. That's all I can come up with. Um, I don't have a better explanation than that. But um, we do have uh, Mary Beth Stephen is coming to do a five part series um, starting at the end of February. And I'll make sure that link is in the email follow up with the recording. Uh, if you're interested in doing some more digging with her, it's a lot like this, except she comes with like decades of classroom knowledge and work that she's done with her grade five and six students around inquiry into spelling and understanding spelling conventions. And um, like she's even had her students make little commercials to explain spelling conventions. And it's pretty cool, the work that she's done with students. Um, how is an assignment like sign? That might be an interesting question to pose to some older students. Um, but again, we can use this matrix to help us build um, all kinds of words. So the task with your students might be, here is a matrix, how many words can you build? with the little caveat that if you build the word you have to be able to use it in a sentence to show you know what it means um so a student might say something like hmm well what about designate designate has to be a word because it's i'm going to use this column no i don't think that's a word but maybe designate is a word, is that connected to sign in some way? I don't know. That would be something to dig through and check out more. Um, so I think 
what I love about word matrices um, and using them in the classroom is that rather than having S-I-G-N as my spelling word, that's one word, I have, and I'm obviously not going to use a matrix this complex with my grade one students, but I could have signs and signing and signer and signed and then maybe someone out there in the land of kids who know it all say i bet signal and sign are related so i'm gonna add signal i think this is how it's built or something like that and so i could have a teeny tiny little matrix but my point is rather than focusing on one word that is the word to learn how to spell we've instantly opened it up to include multiple words and there's no reason that this matrix couldn't exist as a spelling resource where your word wall once existed or in their um, individual you know like student dictionary things notebooks um so we can use that's totally fine claudette enjoy your evening take care um so we can use the matrix to help us stretch and grow the vocabulary development with our students and help them to start see the connectedness between the language and the words that we're learning um, in our classroom. I also hope that you understand um, as we go through this, if it's not clear yet, I am not an expert nor are you expected to be an expert it's totally okay to say you know what i'm not sure about that give me a little bit let me see what i can figure out and come back to it when you start building and working with the word matrix you are quickly going to know and we talked about this last day that you need to spell out the base with the letters and the reason you're spelling out the base with the letters, which is something I'll admit I didn't do before when I worked with prefixes and suffixes, is because of our original question, which is the pronunciation changes as we add different pieces to the puzzle. And so it sounds um, silly, it sounds odd. It, we highlight the oddness of things. Um, if we say sign plus al is signal, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like it just, it's, so we say S-I-G-N plus al is rewritten as S-I-G-N al signal. And we say it at the end, once we've added all the parts in. Um, Pete Bowers does like a whole workshop on spelling out loud. So this is not something you're gonna pick up in the three minutes that I talk about it. Um, but there is a form and a structure where students are acknowledging when that final non-syllabic silent e is being removed and we're adding a suffix like ing and so you they say it out loud that there once was an e there now the e is gone and i'm adding my um ing to the end of it and that's all part of the spelling out loud process so you're really um emphasizing this idea of this is the base this is the morpheme i'm adding to the base and this is the magic that's happening to get the spelling over on the other side of it so if i said to you um how do you say s-i-g-n but then i gave you these four options to choose these four examples well, we say it a little bit different in each one, right? So we have signed, designer, so the S has shifted to a Z sound, signature, and resignation. So we can't, uh, we do, we're doing ourselves a disservice in understanding spelling um, and the phonology attached to letter combinations the graphemes um if we're saying the base word and then adding on the the prefixes and the suffixes so it's really important that you spell out the base um, when you're doing this work with students 
I found this quote and I thought it was very poignant in emphasizing, I think, what becomes the roadblock in a lot of the work that we have done previously around spelling in the work that we've done in our classes. The fundamental and most frequent cause of a misspelling is basing it entirely on what we think is the sound of the spoken word in total isolation from its relatives. So I used to, when students would come up to me in my grade two classroom, I would even do this with my grade nines. Um, I don't know how to spell blah, blah, blah. Well, how do you think it's spelled? And we would go through and, oh, well, in this word, actually, the ch sound is being made by these letters. And we'd have like a little mini lesson around that thing. The whole time, I'm sure they were thinking, on with it already, Miss Craig, like, just give me the word and how to spell it. Um, but now I would probably follow up with, what are some of the relatives or what are the members of the word family is that word part of? Does that help us spell it at all? Um, and maybe it doesn't, but it could be a really nice prompting question to use in addition to how do you think, what sounds do you hear? What are some of the relatives you think are in its word family? Um, because if they know how to spell the word sign and they come up to me and ask me around about how to spell the word signal, or they're spelling assignment wrong all the time, um, or whatever, bringing it back to what the, the relatives are might be a really great way. So if we come back to signature, and it's often misspelt with an I, right? S-I-G-N-I-T-U-R-E by students who aren't necessarily understanding um, things. So if I said the word sign um, is its base, does that help you build it? Maybe it doesn't. Um, are you familiar with the word signate? Or um, is I T E a, a suffix that we've studied. Does that make sense for it to be there? Uh, like there's just other prompting questions that we can use to help to get students thinking about their errors beyond the sounds. Um, and it might feel wonky at first. And so maybe um, you build yourself a little, you know, cheat cheat question. What sounds do you hear? What are some relatives in the word family? Does that help you spell it? Um, you, of course, do some background work. This is not where you start, friends, uh, with that. So this is the longest answer ever to the question that we started with. Why does pronunciation change within a word family? Well, the simple answer is, when we're adding affixes to a base word, it changes the syllable stress. And when we change the syllable stress, it means we're changing pronunciation because we can't ignore the phonology part of orthography. So that's why it's not just studying morphology, a word and its parts. We have to understand the role that phonology plays and how we pronounce words. Uh, additionally, I really liked this fun fact. Um, as we add syllables to the base, we tend to reduce the length of the vowel in the base. So in the base, we have a long I, we add a couple of things to it, and now it becomes a short I in the word signature. So the more stuff you add, the more bling you add to your base word, uh, the more likely it is that you're gonna shorten that um, the vowel sound that you're hearing in the bass. Now, I'm going to say that and someone's going to reply with like, but what about this word? Notice it says we tend to. This isn't the I before E except after C and then let me list you six million exceptions. Well, it's just like a general guideline. As you add stuff, we like to be concise. It's, it's a reason why functional words, which are often our high frequency words, 
are not pronounced the way we think they're going to be pronounced because we truncate them in our speech so that we can get through the stuff we're trying to say. We tend to usually uh, make sure that we are saying content words clearly in our speech. And the other ones, the two, the thes, those kinds of things, we drop off or shorten as we're talking.